Hello and welcome everyone to the Closing Bell Show, where you can invest with the best. This is the home for busy people to learn with other successful investors, navigate the macroeconomic climate with confidence and receive undervalued stock opportunities without having to spend hours researching. If you're enjoying our content, be sure to check out our full content library at gems.closingbell.co. This week, we talk to Aisha Tarek. In her own words, she never dreamed of a career in finance, but ended up in corporate banking, where she worked with multi-billion dollar companies as a lender. From there, she went on to a private family business, managing a portfolio of over $1 billion in real estate, hospitality, and private and public equities. In the chat, we give you an aerial view of the macroeconomic landscape in China right now and why some are saying it is in an opposite position to the likes of the US economy. We also get some stock opportunities from Aisha and her thoughts on Alibaba. It's a company that's been around for a long time and I think it's a company that will stay. It, it, they, they are sort of like the Amazon of that side of the world. We looked at a price target of 160, I think. And we also got a thoughts on Pinduo Duo. Yeah, I think this company could grow and do very well. I think it, it would grow faster than Alibaba at this stage. Even though she never wanted to work in the finance industry, she now realizes that she could never dream of leaving it. I think we'll just jump into it. Um, now, I'm very keen to know your background, Aisha, and without giving too much away, I know that you've spent, you know, 17 years as an investment strategist managing money for uh, multi-billion dollar companies as a lender and then as an investment manager for a, a private family business. Um, but in your words, I, I'm keen to know, you know, who, who is Aisha? Give us your background. Give us the, the, the ABCs of I, Aisha Tariq. Sure. I mean, um, as you rightly said, I have been managing money, but mostly as a lender. So I started off my career as a corporate banker with Standard Chartered. And I spent most of my time uh, there managing uh, large corporate clients and uh, government-related clients as well. So that gave me a lot of exposure to various industries and you know different kinds of businesses, starting from mid-size to very, very large companies. And uh, from there, I went and joined a client of mine who uh, was a family of, or rather is still a family of his family business, uh, running real estate and hospitality mostly, but as well uh, listed and private equity. So I was sort of the head of treasury, if you'd like, and I managed um, all their funding and investments and uh, so on and so forth, and his private money as well. Um, from there, I um, I left and I started my own consulting company. And uh, what I would do is structure deals for um, you know mid to large size corporate companies, uh, whether it would be debt or equity. Um, and more recently, I have been helping a regional bank with their syndications desk. And um, yeah, that's where we stand right now. Awesome. Uh, Nathan, Wonderful. I'll pass over to you. Yeah, thanks for the intro, Aisha. And look, we try to keep things quite lighthearted as we intro uh, here at Closing Bell. So we're going to start with a bit of a whirly question, a bit of a fun one. Um, a friend, marry or kill question. Not sure if you've got too many of them. We're going to keep no, it finance. Really. <laughs> we're going to keep it finance themed. So, friend, marry, kill. Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, or Jack Ma. Uh, Warren Buffett, friend. Charlie Munger, marry. Jack Ma, kill. <laughs> I think there's a there's a few people after Jack Ma then, not just Asia. Yeah. Well, I mean that was just the choice that remained. That's all. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's all right. It's... Xi Jinping couldn't do it, so Aisha will. Um, <laughs> off the back of that, a bit of nostalgia as well. We'd love to hear what your first ever investment was and what interested you about it. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so personally or professionally? No, we'll go personal. Okay. Uh, so personally, I think it was Apple. 
I mean, it's, you know, uh, the choice that everybody probably makes. Um, and um, ha I should say that I haven't been uh, investing personally for too long because um, as part of my job, I really couldn't, I had a lot of inside information. So it was very difficult to sort of, you know, trade the markets or mm. invest for a short time. So we had a lot of uh, disclaimers that we had to make. So I really started investing only after I left uh, corporate banking, so which was about five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, yeah, I think my first investment at the time was probably, yeah, it was Apple, I think. And um, yeah, I've held them ever since. Uh, simply because, um, I mean, I think they're a great company. I think the way they reinvented themselves, you know, mm -hmm. way back when was amazing. I think their products are amazing. Everything I'm using right now is Apple. Yeah. Um, I swear by their products. Uh, even, even through the bad times, the few bad iPhones that they had in between. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm pretty happy with it. And in fact, I have a little motto, which I put out on Twitter all the time. That we never bet against Apple. So yeah. I'll short any company, but I won't short Apple. Yeah, fantastic. And name one person you really admire in the investing world and why. Oh, it goes without saying it's probably Warren Buffett. I'm a big, big fan girl of <laughs> <laughs> Warren Buffett. Um, and I know it's, it's a safe choice and it's a choice that probably everybody makes. It's a boring choice, but I really do admire him for the simple fact that he is simple. Um, his principles are simple. He is simple to follow. Um, he's simple to learn from. Personally, he's, um, quite a quirky person. <laughs> he's not exactly what you would call a very, you know, regular person. He has his little quirks and he'll eat hamburgers and Coke every night for dinner. But, you know, that's what makes him very real. He is who he, he is. He doesn't waver from his principles. Mm. And um, I, I, I can get on board with that. I, li I like the way he uh, approaches things. Absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with admiring the best. That's right. And, and uh, Aisha, I, I'm sure then you like Benjamin Graham and you've read his, his works as well. Of course. I mean, that, that's something, uh, let's say it's mandatory reading <laughs> for people like us, right? Um, yes. And I do, I, I mean, while it's a little bit of a tricky book to get through for everybody, mm -hmm. but I would recommend that everybody does read it at some point, at least in their life, if they yeah. are serious about investing. During, uh, during COVID, I, during the big three month lockdown that we had, I had the book staring at me on a, on a, on my bookshelf for, for a very long time. And I finally went down to read it and it's 700 pages and it's very small <laughs> yes. font and very small lining. And, and it took me three or four weeks to get through it properly. And even then I, th I thought to myself, man, I've got to read this thing, read this thing again. So that yeah. might be saying, saying more about me than it is about the book, but, uh, yeah, great, great read, Nathan, mm. if you ever get the chance. Not really. Yeah. It is, it is a, it is a tough read. I, I wouldn't <laughs> say it's very simple to get through. Well, I'm yeah. a visual learner, so I'll probably give that one a miss. <laughs> <laughs> but we we'll make a movie frank. for you. <laughs> Wolf of Wall Street, that's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, Aisha, before we move on to the macro-related questions and, and stock-related questions, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, TraderAid. I think I've pronounced that correctly. I see it all over your Twitter. That's You've been right. doing a lot of work with that and doing a lot of writing on your Substack. I thought you could give us just the quick genesis story of TraderAid, what you're doing there, and then and then we can move on to the on to some of the content actually that gener that generated from TraderAid. Okay, so actually, it's uh, quite an interesting and quite a new story. Um, so TraderAid was a company that was founded by uh, two gentlemen on Twitter. I'm sure you might have come across them. Uh, they both go by uh, different handles. One is Michigan Gandalf, and one is uh, Markets for Mayhem. So basically, uh, what what happened is, um, you know, we were all friends on Twitter and we were all interacting with each other and we decided to team up and write a few articles and work together on a few articles. 
And then, um, so as we, you know, collaborated more and more, then we just, I mean, they just asked me if I would like to join them. And it was a great honor because they're extremely intelligent, extremely smart and very good people. So that's just, uh, you know, ticks all the right boxes for me. Um, so yeah, I joined them just recently, um, about a week ago now. Um, and what we're doing is we're looking at, so it's for retail, by retail. So basically we look at, uh, you know, breaking things down for the retail investor. It, you know, the subscription is very affordable at $20 per month only, um, and, uh, you know, we have, ex we have, you know, horse who's an excellent uh, day trader and he trades futures. We have mayhem who's really great at macro and trading. And then, um, so I'm bringing in the fundamental and the macro angle. Awesome. And that's, that stuff is shared between your sub stack and, and the trader aid platform. Or so the Substack was something that I was oh, I was writing as a free newsletter for a very long time, and then I decided to go paid for a while. I mean, it's just been I think not even a month that I decided to go paid, and uh, we're sort of just you know this opportunity came up, and it's all falling into one. So it's it's not separate. It's just me putting out my thoughts either here or there, but yeah. it's just the same person. Same content, I mean, just different avenues, that's all. They're yeah, wonderful. And that's probably a good time to segue into this um, macro aspect of the of the podcast. The, namely, the, the three-part series that you've you released uh, is China's Crisis and Investment Opportunity. Um, we'd like to look at one of the extracts here that we can ex expand upon, namely quotation marks, where most countries are opening their borders and increasing rates, China is going through another wave of COVID and easing policies as a result. We see this as an interesting opportunity to explore from a bullish perspective, end quote. So with this in mind, what interests you about China right now? So basically, um, when we look at macro, so this, so just to take a step back, this article was co-written by me and Mayhem. I'm sure you've seen that as well. Um, so our our view is very much that, you know, when you look at macro and you're investing from a macro angle, it's you look at the cycle. And there's a little picture over there in the article as well that shows you how, you know, the economy moves through the cycle. So you have early cycle, mid cycle, late cycle, and end cycle. So where so china right now is in a place which is kind of the opposite of where the us is right so what what happened in the us uh, and many parts of you know the world as well like australia and new zealand uh, europe canada they're all sort of in the us boat right so where you know when you had covid and you had all the crisis um they flooded the market with uh, fiscal, you know, stimulus. Rates were decreased, and so you had a lot of liquidity in the market. You had assets, you know, just soaring in prices, housing prices soaring, and as a consequence, you obviously got um, inflation. And so now, what they're having to do is, in order to curb all of that, they're cutting rates and they're pulling back on the liquidity, right? Um, now, when you look at China, it's just the opposite. So the, I was saying that, you know, China is a little bit in the opposite situation of where the rest of the world is because uh, because of the COVID lockdowns and everything that happened in um, between, um, they're having to actually stimulate the economy. So you've got, uh, we are, they're basically where, the, the other side of the world was about two years ago, right? So mm. what we will see play out is what we've already seen play out sort of in, you know, uh, the US or Australia, where the markets were booming because of all the liquidity that was being injected into the market, whether it's, you know, through fiscal measures or through monetary policy. So you saw what happened to the market, the stock markets in the last two years, right? We have, 
not not counting this year, but you know, uh, the massive, you know, increase in prices and it was like whatever you buy just keeps going up in prices. So what we see in China right now is a similar situation. And we may not have the same level of growth or the same level of um increase in the stock market you know, or increase in prices in the stock market but i we still see this as a very uh positive for asset prices in china now as an extension to that that first point that nathan was making and that first extract um there was another extract mm-hmm. i read to you and then i have a follow-up question so uh, you wrote uh while china potentially has a bullish outlook given the current macroeconomic landscape and the policies that the country is employing, there is a fair degree of risk associated with their political outlook. Uh, Obviously, there's a lot lot, lot happening in China right now from the new COVID lockdowns to China's property debt crisis. Could you talk about the top two or three risks you see playing out in China that retail investors should probably probably be aware of? Sure. So I I think we listed a couple of risks in um, the article because... We obviously don't, so one thing that we said is that we remain cautiously optimistic. So while China, you know, follows this um, investing cycle or this economic cycle where we should have like a bull market and all of that, the country is not without risks. And we know this. We've known this for a while now. And it started off by what, you know, we spoke of in the beginning, Jack Ma. So... Hmm. When uh, when Ant Financial was about to list, I mean, what that's like one and a half years ago or something like that, and then suddenly everything was you know shut down and you know at some point we even thought he disappeared for a while. Mm. You know that sort of gave us an idea, uh, like a glaring made it glaringly obvious that you know mm. things in China are not under anyone's control, right? The government mm. there is very very strong. They control everything. And we know this because, you know, companies like Facebook, Google, all these companies don't have Amazon, can't Mm. really break into China because of Mm. their policies. So Mm. I think this is something that uh, all retail investors are probably already aware of. But it's Mm. still, um, having said that, you you can still invest in Chinese stocks, but you need to be a little bit more careful. So I got out of China right after, you know, everything went down with Jack Ma and all of that because it did scare me. So, and I was worried about what might happen thereafter. Um, but it would seem that the policies are settling a little bit and it would seem that the government now is more concerned about, um, you know, growing and making sure, you know, GDP growth goes back to where they should be. So in terms of risk, I would still say the government policies and, you know, the unpredictability of their Mm. policies is still a major risk. And therefore, even if people are to take positions, I would suggest uh, smaller positions and to be a little bit more cautious. Right. So not to load up the or back up the truck, as they say, <laughs> in Chinese equity. Um, the other risk is quite possibly, you know, the delisting of the ADRs. Um, mm. We have we've been hearing this quite a lot. Now, if the ADRs are I mean, th- there is a problem with, um, you know, reporting standards and um, the U.S. not accepting the Chinese reporting standards. So again, mm. I think this is again a policy issue, right? Um, now, will the Chinese open up their books and change their reporting standards? We don't know. But this is something of a longer term risk in the sense that it would probably play out sometime next year, maybe mm. mid to late next year. And um, what we foresee as an investment is more of a Mid, mid-range mid investments. I'm not saying that we should be invested in China for like the next five, six years, but what we were rather saying is more like um, 12 to 18 month, you know, investment horizon, more of a swing trade kind of 
uh, investment horizon. So in which case, you know, even the delisting of the ADRs should not have much of an impact, but it's still a risk that it might happen. And should that happen, um, these companies will obviously move to, you know, not obviously, but most likely would move to Hong Kong. So in which case there would be reporting issues and all of that, but you could still sort of move your investments um, to uh, Hong Kong. And I think another major risk is probably just, you know, the property market and something that we are seeing play out right now. Now, the property market is much larger than, um, you know, just the stock market or anything concerning retail investors. But um, it, it has a major impact on the economy if there is, a, a, you know, like a serious problem in the property market and it might actually um, collapse, you know, the whole industry. So I think the government is taking measures to try and keep that, you know, in place. I mean, sort of, you know, balance out the property market and make sure that it doesn't collapse on itself. So we'll see how that plays out. But, you know, the government cannot afford for the property market to fail right now. So I think they will do whatever it takes to hold it up. Mm. Yep, understood. A couple of follow-up questions for you, um, Aisha. I'm not too familiar with trades in China. I've actually never traded uh, a stock in, in the Chinese market. Is it hard to uh, exit a trade after you've already made it? made a trade in China? Like, is it, is it harder just because of government regulation or uh, is, it, is it fairly easy to exit trades uh, for retail investors? So what you would be doing is you would actually be investing in the ADRs, which are listed in America, right? So mm. you wouldn't, re so that, that was sort of the recommendation that if you do even think about investing in China, the better option would be to invest in the ADRs. And yeah. other than that, I think, you could probably look at uh, stocks listed in Hong Kong because that's mm. a more liquid market. As far as China is concerned, honestly, even I haven't uh, invested directly in the Chinese market. So I wouldn't be able to tell you whether you could or couldn't get out as an outside investor. You know, as an outside investor. Okay. So, so look, looking at the ADRs, and that's why the listings become problematic for, for investors. Okay. My, my, my second question is more macro. Uh, and I read a book recently by Ray Dalio, uh, The Changing Changing World Order. I don't know if you saw that book, but there's a lot of excerpts floating around Twitter. Uh, and he talks about uh, sort of the life cycles of empires. Um, and he talks about America yeah. versus China. Uh, have you had a chance to read that book? And or have you, th have you thought about that, uh, the relationship America has with China in that context, in the context of like China's on the upswing and America's on the downswing? Do you view it that way? Or is that a mischaracterization of what's happening. I have the book somewhere here, but um, so the thing is, I haven't read it yet, but I have seen videos of Ray Dalio and I think he's like a brilliant, brilliant man. I mean, mm. I, I love the way he thinks and um, I, I love the way he invests. Um, so look, he's not entirely wrong. I, I wouldn't, I mean, I think maybe he's, he's taking it a step like very far saying that, you know, America's on the downtrend, China's on the uptrend, but there is some truth to that, right? I mean, the Chinese economy is in many ways much younger than the American economy, right? And um, their development and their pace of development has been, um, you know, profound over the last uh, few years. And they have firmly established themselves as you know, a formidable superpower, if you'd like, yeah. right? So if you think about manufacturing, I don't think there's anything that you can, I mean, look around your house, I'm sure you'll find dozens of things manufactured in China. So I know that there used to be a thing when we were younger, um, that, you know, anything made in China would break, but yeah. now it's just the opposite. Now everything's yeah. made in China and they're good quality. They're, they, you know, yeah. they, they've become the manufacturing hub of the world. Mm. And um, we can't live without them. It's just impossible. I mean, everything that you... So right now, a, a big portion of, or a big concern with their COVID lockdowns is in fact another round of supply chain issues as well. So when he says this, I do believe there is some truth to it. 
maybe he's being very harsh, but he's not wrong. Mm. Do do you think there's a um a third player in the mix? Do you think India has an opportunity over the next? I don't know. I don't know what the time horizon would be. Twenty years to to emerge as a as a real superpower uh, in this race. So I think India has done very well for themselves, obviously. Um, I, but I think they have like a different set of qualities uh, as opposed to China. So where China is, you know, bread and butter manufacturing and, you know, supplying to the rest of the world, I think India ha- has more of a, you know, they, they're more, they've become more investors, um, supplying more, you know, people. Uh, brain power, that kind of a thing. So I don't know if they will be a superpower, but they will definitely grow to be like a formidable, you know, player in the global Mm. market. Yep, understood. Beautiful. Well, Luke, I think we might move into um, part C here, the the stock breakdown. If you want to get into that. Absolutely. Um, now in your report, Aisha, you talk about Alibaba as a potential investment opportunity. Uh, can you talk to us about Alibaba as an investment opportunity as it pertains to, you know, your outlook, the outlook of the company, maybe the valuation of the company relative to its peers and maybe some of the risks associated with that investment? Sure. So I think one of the reasons we chose Alibaba is because it's still one of the biggest companies, right? Um, It's still the most well-known, most liquid name. And um, it's still the company that we know the best of all the Chinese stocks. I mean, so we've had a lot of Chinese companies come online or, you know, come into the market. But Alibaba still remains the one that everyone knows better than everybody else. Hmm. Now, having said that, they are also uh, somewhat of a maturing company. So if you look at the numbers, if you look at the pretty little graphs that we put there, their growth is slowing. Okay. Their margins are coming down. And this is something that you would expect with any company that has reached like a mature stage. Hmm. Um, I do think that we will see some decline in Alibaba's sales uh, over the next uh, few quarters. We might see like another five to seven percent downside in their uh, revenues, um, and a, and somewhat more margin compression. But they do have, uh, so they're still they still have one of the largest you know customer base. Firstly, secondly, I think um, something that my partner said was um, they're doing very well in their cloud services. Although yeah. there's been some recent news of some leaks, uh, you know, with regards to their cloud services. And I yeah. think that's something that we need to sort of dig into a little bit more. Um, but it's a company that's been around for a long time. And I think it's a company that will stay. It, it they, they are sort of like the Amazon of that side of the world. Um, they are buying companies around, uh, you know, even outside China. So, for example, at Malaysia, Singapore, um, even parts of the Middle East like Turkey and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. So they, they're, um, so that's probably one of the reasons we chose them because they are a mature, well-known company. So, and um, as far as price targets go, so again, this is something that we looked at for like a 12 to 18 month you know, time horizon. And we both came to the conclusion that, you know, based on, you know, uh, discounted cash flow and based on what he was seeing in charts, we um, we looked at a price target of 160, I think. Um, hmm. And the way we would see it is if it hits your price target or if it's, if, if it's somewhere, you know, in that vicinity, we close the trade. So just mm. take your profits, get out. It, it's not so, it's not a stock you want to marry. Simple as that. Yeah. Uh, can, mm. can you explain, Aisha, uh, on the margin compression side, what, what the catalysts are for that? Uh, is it is it smaller players kind of uh, chipping away at the corners of of their product suite because they're quite they're quite expansive now. They they have products in a whole a whole bunch of different industries. Is that the reason, or is, you know, can can you expand on why why you think that may be? 
So obviously one of the reasons was costs. I mean, they are seeing inflation in other parts of their businesses, even if not directly in China. Um, another uh, another issue was the way that they were doing these community uh, purchases. So what they would do is they would go out and they would, you know, uh, they would do bulk purchase, like bulk sales within a community. And that sort of drove margins down quite a lot as well. Um, I think another reason for their margins coming down is simply because they are maturing, you know. Um, they've always had, let's say, you know, selling low cost items and stuff like that. And I think with what's going on around, on around the world in terms of logistics and inflation, it is hitting them and it is causing their margins to compress. Awesome. Um, Nathan, yes. I'll, I'll pass it on to you to ask for the second, second stock. Yeah, for sure. Um, so similarly to the, the wonderful breakdown you've just done there for Alibaba. We'd also like you for our, the benefit of our listeners to, to hear you sort of assess, um, and I may pronounce this incorrectly, pin duo duo, which is something that you've written about as well. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also there, I mean, I've done some reading on them, but just for the benefit of the listeners, explain what they do, um, high level, and then yeah, dive into your sort of thesis the business sure so i think i i don't know how to pronounce this very well either um i do believe it's a chinese name and it's pronounced slightly differently from how we do it so we'll just call them pdd for now um yeah. but i think you know as we were doing our research we came across this company and we really liked what they stand for so they are doing so they're an e-commerce company uh, similar to Alibaba and similar to the other e-commerce companies, but they're very focused on agriculture. And, you know, this really caught our interest because what they're doing right now is they are actually investing a lot of money in agriculture as well. And they are trying to support the farmers um, in China uh, to bring fresh produce to, you know, uh, the people in the cities. And they don't charge margins. So they don't charge the farmers uh, to use their platform to sell, uh, which is something very noble, I think. And um, what they're trying to do is accelerate the time um, to sort of from, you know, uh, you know, bringing it out from the farms to the table. So that's that's something that we thought was very interesting. They are also... Um, investing in sustainable farming practices and trying to, you know, uh, make sure that you know, there's always fresh food uh, available to the people. And I think one, one other uh, aspect of this is they've gotten a lot of support from the government for doing what they're doing, because not only are they helping people uh, like the urban customer with, you know, supplies of fresh uh, vegetables and fruits, but they're also helping the farmers. And I think the farmers, in some respect, you know, when, when a country grows and becomes very industrialized, people tend to forget the farmers. And um, so they're playing an important role, not just from uh, an e-commerce perspective, but as well uh, from, you know, a community perspective. So this is one reason that I thought, you know, they, we thought that they have a slightly different angle. And I think they will be supported by the government very well for doing what they're doing. So that sort of mitigates the risk a little bit about, you know, the policy, the government policies and the unknowns that we were talking about. Um, now, in terms of growth, I think they're still quite a young company, but they've been growing very well. Um, again, last quarter, I think everybody took a hit. Um, Alibaba, um, BDD, most of the other companies, they all took hits because of the lockdowns. But they still fared okay. Um, they've become cash flow positive now recently, I mean this year. So that that's a good thing. And uh, 
yeah, I think this company could grow and do very well. I think it, it would grow faster than Alibaba at this stage. Yeah. I think that, that sums it up really well. Luca. Yep. Awesome. Ayesha, thank you very much uh, for having the conversation. 